current administration will continue in that vein. Hofstra and the surrounding community benefit from that ethos, uh, the sense that problems should be addressed by skills, knowledge, and embodied work uh, by several means, whether it's the Center for Civic Engagement, our Division of Student Affairs, um, Intercultural Engagement and Inclusion, Hofstra dedicates its resources to help the surrounding community. We're committed to providing volunteer opportunities, service learning, internships, and community partnerships that have two primary outcomes. One, they enable our, our driven and knowledgeable students and faculty to share their gifts and their drive for social justice with the community. Second, they allow our students and faculty to learn from the community. Students take what they learn back to their classrooms, peers, and uh, their careers. The field experience for faculty informs their knowledge of theory and provides them with research opportunities. We have the pleasure today of having with us four of the Center for Civic Engagement's longstanding community partners, organizations that, in some cases, have worked with Hofstra undergraduates for many years. These include the Uniondale Community Land Trust, a group that employs creative solutions to local housing challenges. The Long Island Alliance for Peaceful Alternatives, a group that promotes peace, nonviolence, human security, and that promotes dialogue on America's role in the world. Uh, the Greater Uniondale Area Action Coalition, often referred to as GWAC, a group comprised of representatives of 26 area civic groups working to strengthen the collective voice of Uniondale's residents and businesses. We're also very proud to have with us uh, the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island, uh, an organization that seeks to help poor and vulnerable people in, in, on Long Island. We work with many more, but unfortunately don't have the time to feature each. However, before we begin, I wish to draw your attention to the many groups tabling in the back of the room. Uh, we have with us representatives for rescuing families, Women's Diversity Network, UNICEF, LEAF, Glamour Gals, Operation Smile, the Muslim Student Association, the NAACP, and the Hofstra Hempstead Tutoring and Mentoring Program. We'll break today with time remaining and hope you'll get to know uh, these groups and we hope our speakers and these tabling groups inspire you to volunteer and to intern and inquire about them. Uh, now to uh, get underway, uh, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Alex Attili, who is the recipient of the 2021 Vincenzo Peace Fellowship. Uh, Attili is an accomplished and inspiring undergraduate who has direct experience working with several of these organizations. And I'm very honored to introduce her, Alex. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alex. I'm a political science major with a double minor in both Spanish and Latin American Caribbean studies. And I've been so grateful to have been with CCE since the second half of my freshman year. This is actually kind of funny because this means I've been with more, I've had a more virtual experience with CCE than I have actually in person. This is actually my first CCE event in person since the pandemic began. So, Despite all that, CCE has been one of the highlights of my academic career here at Hofstra. I have been incredibly lucky to be able to work with not only the other fellows who share many of the same interests and passions that I do in helping our community beyond the campus, but also with the community partners that we have today. The Center for Civic Engagement is all about learning beyond the classroom and engaging our community. And too often, I think undergraduates like myself just tend to live in a bubble on campus and forget that there are opportunities to get involved and volunteer in the community beyond our campus. We have some really wonderful panelists today that I am honored to introduce. First up is Paul Gibson and Janine Maynard from Guac. Paul Gibson is currently retired. He has been a resident of Uniondale for 35 years and is a co-facilitator of Guac. He is also a Uniondale Community Council Board member and the president of UCLT. Janine Maynard is also a co-facilitator co of WAC and has lived in Uniondale for 32 years. So. Thank you very much, Alex. 
Uh, as she mentioned, we are an organization of organizations. Uh, and, as you, and as you heard, well, there are 26 different organizations that are represented in WAC. We don't have a formal structure. We don't have a president. We don't have a vice president. We have two facilitators. Janine, I'm going to introduce, uh, came. I asked her to come here to give you some history and some further understanding of what because she's been here and she's one of the original facilitators. So Janine Mayer. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I want to thank um, Hofstra and the inauguration of uh, the ninth president, Susan Posner, for having us here today. And for the group who really recognizes the value and how important our work has been with our community. The community service has really formed what we've been capable of over the years. So um, with that as a start, I'd like to introduce who Walk has been and where we're going. Okay. Walk's mission was captured essentially um, earlier today, but um, it, it is to promote grassroots democracy and community development to change the context of economic marginalization and political exclusion. So, Guac began in 2009, actually, with the development of community summits. And at that time, we weren't known as Guac. But it was right after the meltdown and housing crisis that hit our neighborhood after 2008. And we saw a tremendous amount of light. And we also had heard about the development coming in around the Nassau Coliseum area. And we saw all the indications of splitting the community apart. And along with that, a new CDP showed up. Um, designating the northern part of Uniondale with another name. And it really activated the community to begin to understand what was going on and what we needed to do. At the time, we were denied opportunity to do community visioning. And when we fought for it, um, we were told we didn't have enough of a unified voice. So we developed these summits to pull our voice together and to understand we're all different organizations, we're all doing different things, but what do we hold together as important work to do? Greg Rainey came in as our first keynote speaker, and he was invited back to be our second keynote speaker, and he stayed on and helped us develop the name of Quack, and our major um, points, where we come together and we call them points of unity. So when we go forward into the community, and we speak with politicians or other people, they know that when Guac shows up, we show up on the basis of points of unity throughout the community where we have wide consensus on what's the most important thing. So this is a slide that shows him at work at one of our early summits, how active he was and how he taught us to document people's feedback and begin to have the conversations that let us set priorities and then develop an action plan. So in reviewing this, you know, Paul said, you know, good research produces good change. And that's been a lot of the basis of how we partnered with um, the university and our community to work together to understand our story and then to bring it forward to places of change. So we started out with four priorities back in the day. And um, that's developed to eight priority areas. And each priority area is then served by campaigns or work that we do as small groups. And so um, we really cover a, a wide variety of topics, but most of it speaks to the fact that we have been a disenfranchised community and we did not have a strong political voice. And we were not being recognized in places where we could draw down resources for change. And we were concerned for our youth and for the safety of our neighborhood and also for the ongoing you know, political definitions of how we would be moving forward as a neighborhood. So that slide is an example of early work in the neighborhood around change that comes with development. And here we, we were reviewing slides of, of what was going to happen along Jerusalem Avenue. So as an example, we got wind that there would be some development work on Jerusalem Avenue, and two of our oldest environmental activists raised concern because that would interrupt some areas of wetlands along the Meadowbrook Parkway. And in doing the research about what was planned, 
nobody expected Superstorm Stan Sandy to come along and you know, upend those plans. But when it did, the situation became even more serious. Um, we ended up with a sewer line that was going to be put through Jerusalem Avenue that would um, possibly have a risk of discharge into a creek area. And in order to understand the risks and environmental questions, we partnered with Hofstra and um, a graduate student here, um, Matt Krasinski, and he actually delivered um, one of our summits as a keynote speaker on the issue of water safety, C4, and understanding the impact of certain types of sewer uh, lines and where the leakage could be, risks of methane and other kinds of things. Um, it helped the neighborhood understand its point so that if you're talking to developers about community benefits, you know where the risks are and you understand what, what needs to be said in order to get change. It helped us fight back an overuse of um, laundromats coming into the neighborhood <laughs> and a number of other things. So this partnership has been very, very important to our conversation and our knowledge to build what our neighborhood knows and the way we use our information. Um, the slide just before, oh, so th this is about the outfall, and this is some of his presentation that he made. So, a lot of the keynote work is to unify the definition of, of Uniondale. And after the 2010 census, where the top portion was carved off and they tried to get us to co-sign that, the community really rose up. And Greg Maney was <coughs> key in leadership in helping us um, research and understand all of the points that needed to be brought forward. We were told we could never change this. And older members of our community had tried to change it for over um, 39 years. Well, it turned out we did our original research. We found the points a fact. We brought them forward and we changed it. And in 2015, the resolution that is, on, is posted there was um, developed in the town of Hempstead, removing the name of East Garden City and retiring it for use in the town of Hempstead. And it was in that fight that Paul Gibson showed up and he's been an active part of WAP and now is the co-facilitator. Um, Greg Manny did pass on and we miss him dearly, but we have carried forward in, in real tradition and in honor. Um, and Paul has been absolutely wonderful. It's large shoes to fill. And part of it is that we all work a lot with partnerships. We learned how to collaborate and we learned how to use information. So thank you. Thank you, Hofstra. Thank you for all the teamwork. Thank you for teaching us how to document and film all of the elements that, that bring talents forward and help us move our discussion. We've had help on the internet and all the skills that we need in order to be ready for action going forward. So I'm going to turn it over for some of you. to give her an extra 20 bucks for all the great things she said about Paul Gibson. Um, one of the things that, that she mentioned though is that we, we did research and we coalesced to try and get things done. And I wanted to move to the next slide which gives you an example of what happens when you put together the community, Hofstra University, and the civic organizations. 2020 was a strange year as we all know, we're all nodding, yes. In that year, they decided that this would be the perfect time to count to see how many people are around in America. And, and notwithstanding the fact that we were hiding, we were, we were not in our places where we would normally would be during the year. Uh, we were home, we were perhaps hungered down someplace else, the census occurred. Well, Uniondale did not have anyone assigned to help, to assist from the government to count. And we, we I guess, well, through its organization put in an, a, proposal to get that kind of help, have a paid staff member, and our proposal was turned down for whatever reason, we'll never know. But the idea is that we coalesced and we, we organized ourselves. And what you see on the, on the top of the, either, on either side where we show the flyer, that's a flyer that went out to the community through email and paper every week. 
showing a comparison of where we stood as Uniondale compared to Nassau County. Basically the rabbit in front of the, the rabbit in front of the dog race. And the idea is we were going to somehow or another not only meet but try and do better than we did in 2010 when we did have people that were hired um, to help us out. And we did have money resources to be able to undergo and conduct campaigns. Well, long story short, as you can see, we, we trailed Nassau County to the very end, but I'm proud to say that Nassau County led the state, so we weren't doing too badly. What I wanted to show in the middle is the fact that it, it's small, but compared to, this is, this is a, a actual count of self-enrollment. So, as you know, the process is you get to do it yourself and somebody comes knocking on your door. In our community, we realize people knocking on the door probably has an adverse effect in terms of getting an accurate count. So we push to get the count done by people um, on their own initiative. We exceeded our 2010 uh, percentage on self-enrollment through the efforts of, 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 of our community. Exceeded. But at the same time, as Janine mentioned, good facts give you good, good arguments. Those two indicators in red show the two uh, areas where we actually did not reach the 2010 goal. So guess what will happen? Um, we, we actually we monitored this all during the process. We put a lot of resources, a lot of energy to get that gap closed. We didn't quite do it, but those are the two leading areas the last time around. And by the way, after the self-enrollment, we continue to push in to get people to respond. So I'm confident, we'll see in the, in the statistics that come out later on this month, maybe next, that we did okay in those two areas, but tracking it and using the kind of research gave us an opportunity to just concentrate and make sure that we showed up. And quite honestly, this was, that, that flyer was done by a Hofstra student. Okay, we collected the data by, by just going to different resources, and we used our contacts. Those little words on the very top are all the organizations where it says 2020 census. Above there you'll see lines, you can't make it up. But those are all the organizations that signed up to distribute and encourage people to, to, to uh, get their members to, to join us up, to respond to the census. Next slide. How many people voted last year? Raise your hand. I'm glad to see that it's the majority. How many people voted from where they lived? How many people voted from Uniondale? Okay. We found out, thank you, we found out that 2020 was going to be particularly challenging and um, we put together an initiative last year that said, okay, members, people in the community of Uniondale realize this is a bizarre year. Let's give you information about what to do to vote. And this was done by the lady over here on my right, um, who, would, <laughs> who worked with the organization to, to, to put together various campaigns, different languages, all describing what the changes were for 2020 and how to address it. And that was the combination of Hofstra and the community. So the last thing I want to do is, is turn it over to let you hear from a CCE person um, to describe our last campaign, the most recent campaign. Lauren? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lauren. I've been with CCE in Guac for a year now, and it's been amazing. Um, our most recent um, campaign was a Did You Know campaign um, going over different areas in Uniondale that may be considered, that used to go under the name East Garden City, but that has formerly been retired. There was a lot of effort put into this. We made a website, we made flyers, we did a lot of research, a lot of QR codes. Um, and yeah, it was really important to solidify the boundaries of Uniondale for multiple reasons, for uh, safety, for um, economic purposes. So um, me and another fellow, Damali, worked on these posters, and Damali and I, with another member of the community, Marvin, worked on the website. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. So thank you very much. I'd like to wrap up by talking about what we're focused on going forward. 
perhaps you've heard about it, it's only $1.5 billion being invested in the Unidale community in the form of the hub. And uh, to not, to, to, I guess in the, in the interest of time, I'm going to let you read up here, but just, just understand that Guac as a coalition will have representation in all aspects of, do its best to have representation in all aspects of, of the development itself. We've been invited through members of the community uh, by uh, our elected officials and by the developers to sit at the table to discuss the impact and also to, to help to form, to provide information that would be the basis of the community benefits agreement. So in effect, Uniondale recognizes that in addition to the economic impact and the benefit to Nassau County, Uniondale will also be affected and the community benefits agreement will be something that will target some of the impact mitigate some of the impact, to improve some of the, the impact, and also to include Uniondale as this thing is developed. So that's our focus. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for inviting us. Take care. Thank you. So our next panelist today is Nicole Jean Christian from UCLT, the Uniondale Community Land Trust. Nicole has helped businesses with economic development through various means throughout her long and distinguished career. She has 15 plus years of experience grant writing for local municipalities, educational institutions, nonprofits, and helps with community development and revitalization within the community. She has worked with the New York Department of Conservation, the New York Department of State, and many other institutions throughout the course of her career. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Nicole Jean Christian. I'm the first executive director of the Indian Community Land Trust. I'm joined here with who I call our senior stateswoman, um, the lead of our dream team, our CCE dream team, Michaela Erickson. Um, just a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, as you know, the Uniondale Community Land Trust was started um, back in 2010 in the aftermath of one of the worst um, global and economic catastrophes we had ever experienced. Um, after that period and during that period, our community was left with scores of zombie homes, um, abandoned, foreclosed, and otherwise blighted properties throughout the community. We had one of the highest concentrations of zombie homes in Long Island. And we were the highest in Long Island, one of the highest in New York State. So 6,500 are odd homes in Uniondale. And of those 6,500, over 400 were properties that were considered abandoned, were in foreclosure. And then we had about 60 or more that were in zombie status. So these were homes, as you can remember, you could walk down the street and seemingly out of nowhere, you would see this home that was dilapidated, blighted, seemed abandoned or foreclosed. And this was happening across the region, but specifically highly concentrated in Uniondale. And as a result of that, in response to this crisis, and you heard from Paul and Janine about the work with WAC, and as a part of this uh, community-led effort, members came together and created a land trust, which allows the community to acquire these properties and transform them into permanent affordable housing. So the idea is for us to create home ownership opportunities for folks in the 80 to 70 to 80 percent median income. The median income for Nassau County is 126,000. So you're looking at someone that's making 60, 70 thousand dollars and have the opportunity to own a home. The unique aspect of UCLT, which is really exciting for me and which made my job really rewarding, is that the UCLT started with community roots and continues to be community-led. So everything that we do is all from a strategy that comes from the community. And it keeps us really in, on the pulse of what's happening. We don't lose sight of what's really happening in the community because of that unique aspect. Our first home we were able to purchase right after our formation in 2017 on Macon Place. Michaela's gonna talk a little bit about our first home buyer. Um, Michaela did a wonderful job documenting our first homeowner's journey from being a renter to owning a home in Uniondale. It was really exciting. We have two more homes in the pipeline, one on Uniondale Avenue and one on Bird. Um, Uniondale Avenue is gonna be 
unique. It's going to be a modular home. Um, it's a little bit of a smaller, a smaller footprint. We are going to have some seriously um, beneficial, environmentally sustainable components. Um, geothermal HVAC, solar panels, an EV, char EV charging station. So we believe that sustainability is also affordability. We don't believe that environmental sustainability is limited because of whatever your income may be. So that's something we're very excited about. And then we have a partnership with the Hempstead Community Development Agency to also bring a home on Bird, um, 40 Bird in uh, the Hempstead area. So we're very happy about our strategic partnerships that we have with the community and with Hofstra University. So I want to just take a quick moment, that's why I went through who we are and what we've done, and talk a little bit about our strategic and uh, relationship with the CCE and internship team. Um, Michaela came on and she um, became, like I said, I consider her our senior stateswoman. Um, I consider her um, a lead at this point as far as what we're doing moving forward with our um, image and our presence in the public sphere. And I'm going to give her a moment now to just talk about where we're going from here and some of the things that she's going to do as she rounds out her educational uh, journey. I'm Michaela. I'm a senior journalism major here at Hofstra, and this is, um, I've been with UCLT for a year now. Thank you for holding everything she says. It's always so kind. Um, so when individuals have access to stable, quality, affordable housing, they can become a, diverse, a part of diverse communities, find jobs, lead healthier lives, and take better care of their children. So obviously housing is something that everybody needs access to. And as we mentioned before, um, all the homes acquired by UCLT are sold to families earning 50 to 80 percent of Nassau County's area of medium income. Um, and that is just a big mission of ours. And as we mentioned, we closed on our first home in the past year. So that was a really exciting moment. Um, the homeowners are usually identified via like a lottery system. So our first homeowner and her son moved in 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 April of 2021 and you can see here this is her in front of the house with a nice little key sign <laughs> and the top is the house when it was acquired and this is what it looks like now as you can see it was a full renovation um, just very exciting stuff all around there was a welcome caravan for her and her family we had the Uniondale Fire Department leading the drive-by and it was just a really nice community event. There hadn't been a lot of gatherings, obviously, due to COVID, but this was a really special event. Um, another thing we accomplished this past year, uh, Nicole Jean and some other members of the board co-wrote an op-ed, and it was published in the LI Herald on uh, Long Island Business News. And that's kind of something we're trying to continue. We want to get more op-eds out and kind of continue to make a name for the organization across Long Island, because it's a really valuable resource. Uh, last October, we had our first ever Housing Heroes event, and that honored Councilwoman Dorothy Goosby, and we're hoping to have that event again in November, so keep an eye out for that. It's a really cool event. Um, just some more pictures from that. And we had our first ever Housing Symposium back in April, and that was just an opportunity for different organizations, housing related or otherwise, to come together and just talk about what um, next steps look like and what their concerns were coming out of the pandemic and what things can look like going forward. Um, and that's just another photo from the Welcome Caravan and sh shares the mission of community engagement and education. three internships, three interns as well, um, and every intern uh, we work together to put together a work plan. The CC and the interns, we actually come together. We have what we consider circular leadership. So we put a work plan together, we come up with a schedule, and then we 
have our strategic plan for each month. And one of those things was coming up with a fundraising plan for the year. And because of our CCE team, we were able to look at what our needs were strategically and move forward from there. Another part of that was the symposium, which was the first ever um, actual gathering of housing organizations across Long Island to come up with solutions. And we created a white paper. We're using that now for a, a winter reconvening. And we're hoping to have an action plan to come out of that. We also created, for the first time, a community engagement plan. So we had a series. We had six workshops for the year that focused on wealth building, buying a home, um, becoming prepared financially, and we're continuing that into 2022. And we will have our um, event in November, our Housing Heroes. We're actually going to be honoring a leader in the community. And in the last slide we were able to develop our fund development plan. So there are now three ways to give to UCLT. This was something that our um, crew, our team, we all came together and created. So now folks can find out very easily how they can give either one time as a sustaining supporter or as a sponsor of an event. All of these things have really helped create the track for UCLT to continue well into the future. I'm honored today that you had us here. Um, we're definitely a continued partner with Hofstra with the newly inaugurated president, and thank you for your time. So, thank you so much. Um, our next panelist today is Kirsten Bartolota. Kirsten is an attorney and the client services manager at the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island, which is actually my community partner last semester. She has worked in the field of the sorry, she has worked in the field of community and public health for the last 15 years with a focus in access to health and fitness resources for all communities. Her most recent experience during the pandemic was working with New York State as a supervisor for contact tracing and case isolation management. She is now working with the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island, building new programs and motivating staff to be a part of making positive changes in our Long Island communities. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for having me. It's a great program. Um, so I work for Health and Welfare Council of Long Island. Um, we have been in existence for 75 years. I want to tell you about our core values. So our core value is to assist the underserved, the in need, the vulnerable people in our community with a goal to bring equity and access to all of Long Island residents. And you can see we serve a lot of different groups. We have seniors, recent immigrants, people of color, veterans, people with disabilities, and female-headed households with small children are some of the groups that we serve. So when we bring somebody in, I know we were talking about you know, interns and fellowship in our relationship with Hofstra. We bring in people, we bring in interns, we bring in fellows, we bring in employees. We always ask this question. What is your definition of social justice? And that's what we are about. So we want to see what people feel about that when they start working with us. And we do have people that say, I don't know what that means. And that's okay, because not all of us have come from a background that that is always relevant in their everyday lives in the beginning. So we can sometimes have to explain it. And the definition that we use is on the screen. Social justice means equal rights and equitable opportunities for all. So we always want to see what people say in relation to this definition before they start working with Health and Welfare Council of Long Island. So I want to tell you what we do. So we work through two paths. Um, one of them is direct services. We have people that, we have staff that works directly with the public. And then we also are an umbrella organization for other organizations. And I'll explain a little bit about that. It's hard how I'm navigating my body like this, I'm sorry. So um, we work on a bunch of services. We do health care applications, and we help people navigate their health care. So we have staff that does that. We tell them about what to do, you know, what's available, and what, um, what is affordable for them and their families. Um, we also do SNAP uh, food app. No, it's okay. Thank you. 
Um, we do SNAP, we do food insecurity. And what's important about food insecurity is not only do we do applications, but we educate. Because somebody on Long Island today can have enough money, or we can say barely enough money, to for food, and the next day they can find themselves in a situation where they don't. So it's very important for us to do outreach and presentations on that. We have ERAP now, um, if anyone's unfamiliar, it's in relation to the pandemic where we, are, we have lost money, we've lost our jobs, and now we can't pay our rent, so we have programs for that. And then we have a new, we're always building, and we have a new program called the uh, Community Response Coalition, and that is going to be collaboration, and that's gonna be a great um, new program that we're building where we have, um, when someone, let's say someone loses their job, and the next day they have to call New York State for unemployment, there's a whole bunch of other things they might need to do. They might need food, they might need health care, they might need counseling. So we have created an, a new project where we help people find all of those services. And we're also an umbrella organization. So we have lots of organizations under us that come to us for information and resources and education and best practices in the community-based organization world. And lastly, we are partners. We have over 200 partners, um, and that is across sectors in relation to our work. So that would be government agencies, that would be for-profit businesses, nonprofit businesses, all working together to come up with solutions with dealing with Long Island. So I want to tell you guys that I was an intern a long, long, long time ago. I was not a fellow. I know it's different. But I got the job to, I, I wanted to be an intern for a law office because I, I was going to law school. And I was very interested in real estate. And I was very interested in one practice. So I reached out to them and I said, can I intern for you? And they were so excited. So they said, absolutely. And so I went down to Macy's and I bought my first suit and I borrowed a, a bag and I showed up all excited and they brought me in and they walked me down to the law library, which was the basement with one escape window. And I sat down and they gave me a big piece of paper with about 30 questions to research. And that was my internship. And it left an impact on me in relation to work we do with students and fellows and interns. So we want to make sure that we're providing something for our interns and our fellows. Make sure they're learning, make sure they're getting the information. We had a fellow from Hofstra in 2020. She was wonderful and she works on our communications for our organization. And one of the things that are complicated with our organization is that we have two target audiences. We have the um, nonprofits and the, and the businesses, and then we have the direct services, the people. So we have to communicate. And so that's what we needed from this fellow, and she was excellent at creating communications that were relevant and important and clear in reaching all the people that we need to. So when we're looking for fellows, we look for uh, having a clear understanding of our core value communication, being able to understand who our target audience is, being creative, and what goes along with that is taking risk. So I just had an intern conversation this morning with one of our interns and I said, I need this and I want you to be creative and it's okay if you come to me on Friday and you say you failed and you know we'll see what happens. We'll find out on Friday. He said, if you fail, it's, it's okay, this is the time. So that's what we like to tell our fellows. And how we improve with our fellows and what we do when people intern and our fellows for us is we meet up a lot, we communicate, and we do reports. We make sure they communicate with us about what they've learned, what the problems are, and also what their roadblocks are. So I just wanna end with our organization because of fellows, because of our work with Hofstra, we have learned to be flexible. We have become a better organization. We've become more accountable to students, to learning, to the future of our work staff. And we want to give our fellows the great opportunity to uh, do something they love and do something they know, but also to find an area where they don't, they don't know. They didn't know they loved it. And they can learn something new. 
And that's it. We consider this whole program incredible because it helps us and it helps the fellows and the students. So we'll keep building together to make a better Long Island. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist today is Margaret Melconian. Margaret Melconian is the executive director and a founding member of the Long Island Alliance for Peaceful Alternatives and is the downstate co-fair of, co co of Peace Action New York State. She served as a coordinator of the Peace Fellows Program at Hofstra University. She also was the vice president of the Hague Appeal for Peace. She also studied fine arts at Hunter College and is a graduate of Hofstra University and lives in Uniondale with her husband, Mark, who teaches economics at Hofstra. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. Um, <laughs> Hofstra is like coming home. Um, and if you, and I'm really um, grateful for being invited to this panel, but also it's home because I work with Paul and, um, and call and, and because we live in Uniondale, Marty and I, and raised our children in, in, in Uniondale. We've lived in Uniondale for, for 50 years, and Marty has taught here in Hofstra for 55 years. Hofstra is home. Um, and uh, the connections between all of our organizations and other organizations um, is, is really, um, very illustrative of the title of this panel in terms of bridge, building bridges from the university to the uh, to the community, especially the community so close, Uniondale and Hempstead and beyond. Uh, the alliance was founded right here at Hofstra University in 1985 on the tenth floor of the library. Organizations on Long Island, and that was in at the height of the Cold War, and organizations on Long Island were already meeting informally throughout the early 80s, uh, looking at the issues of the, the possibility of nuclear war, um, what was going on in Central America. Groups like uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, League of Women Voters, um, Uniondale Hempstead Peace Committee, the, the Rockville Center Citizens for Survival, and also in Port Washington, War Resisters League, uh, both in Nassau and Suffolk, but we met together in, in a formal way. So in 1985, on the 10th floor of the library here at Hofstra, peace and religious and, and civic and social justice groups came together um, to create a professional peace institution, to have a visible presence on Long Island, and to develop long-term meaningful relationships with the other sectors of the Long Island community. We were called the Long Island Alliance to prevent nuclear war, because that's what we could agree on. <laughs> um, with the end of the Cold War, um, they, people thought we would go out of business. I'm in the peace business, that's, what I, that's how I describe myself. Um, and we, at a meeting, uh, renamed ourselves the Long Island Alliance to, uh, for Peaceful Alternatives. And our mission has been, because foreign policy and nuclear war or how our money is spent, how, what the national budget is, is, is too important to be uh, left to the guys in Washington or the guys on television. It really needs to be embraced um, uh, by ordinary people like you and me. Um, and so our mission was to educate ourselves and to educate Long Islanders about national uh, peace and national security issues and to encourage a dialogue. One of the first things we did as the Alliance was several town meetings. What, what is national security? How do we define it? Um, and we had gatherings that looked at that. From the beginning, we linked our educational and advocacy efforts with defining peace and meeting community needs. And that's the other connection to Hofstra as our home. It was groups like Interfaith Nutrition Network and Long Island Cares and other groups that, especially uh, the Interfaith Nutrition Network, that grew out of Hofstra. Students going into the city to feed people during the 80s 
um, and then coming back on the train at night and seeing what was going on in Hempstead and saying, we have to do something here. We don't have to get on the train and go to New York City. We have to do something there. Brother Mike Moran was involved at that point with um, the Catholic, uh, the Newman program here at Hofstra. So, um, we, we, and we, so we defined always housing and, um, and hunger issues and pe people being homeless on Long Island with preventing war, you know, and we, we talk a lot about that when we work with uh, students in the Peace Fellows Program that we did here at Hofstra from 2013 to 2019. What is peace? What is war? If we did that right now, that exercise, we can all come up with the bombers and the explosions um, and, and what war looks like. But when we ask what peace looks like, it doesn't seem real. It looks like a sunflower or it looks like, it's, and as, as I think it, uh, Jane Addams or someone, one of the Nobel Peace Prize winners said, it, uh, peace is um, not just the absence of violence, it's also the pres presence of uh, justice. So when you look at peace, what is it? Peace is healthy babies. Peace is clean water. Peace, uh, peace is people having good playing jobs. Peace is having uh, our children grow up in a, in a world without war. So um, the Alliance has been grateful um, and has gained so much for being a community partner with the Center for Civic Engagement and for so many years. We've promote, promoted community involvement in Hofstra's programs, including the lecture series. There's going to be one next week with Daniel Ellsberg. It's a virtual program, so no one has an excuse to miss it. So, and there's some flyers in the back. Um, we've also involved uh, students and the community in the three presidential debates with Mario and, and other folks as well. Um, and in, as I said, from 2013 to 2019 in the spring semester, we, with the CCE, um, coordinated and collaborated on the Peace Fellows Program. And the Peace Fellows Program, for, for those years, brought students together to examine U.S. role in the world, to engage and learn skills in civic dialogue, um, uh, deliberative dialogue, um, and to look at how they saw the world and what events uh, brought them to that. Um, and one of the outcomes, I think, of the Peace Fellows Program that we're really proud of um, with faculty like Andrea Lagresco and Marty and, and Mario and Mike DiNincenzo, and I'm going to leave somebody out, so please forgive me. But s several of the faculty that was strong support for that Peace Fellow Program and bringing people in. And those students, over 70 of them, went out into the world, into peace and social justice and, and law schools and, and other places and continued to do the work that they began to think about um, when they came together uh, for those weeks in the program. They've, and one of the outcomes that I'm really pleased about is the development of the curriculum for the Peace Studies uh, pro, um, curriculum and also for the Peace Studies minor in Hofstra. And Andrea and I brought some materials back there about the Peace Studies minor and also for the Center for Civic Engagement course. For the Alliance, and I know it's, it's, a, it's like a leap Right to go from um, the, the zombie houses in Uniondale that we know well and the, the gas stations that were empty so long on those corners and all of those meetings that we attended together about um, how we're going to deal with that and what our vision for the community was and, and to organize and get strong enough so that there was enough power for the politicians to say, we've got to pay attention to these people in Uniondale. And you know that communities around um, Long Island are doing that as well. Our current work connects all of that stuff when you think about um, the role that Center for Civic Engagement and uh, the, the young women and men that work with us in terms of the, how do we how do we get the message out that there's connections between war and what's happening right here in Uniondale or in Hempstead? The connections. I mean, Martin Luther King told us during Vietnam that, and we can we know it now too with the endless wars that the bombs that are falling in Vietnam are falling here at home. You don't just have to drop a bomb on somebody and kill them. You just don't have to feed them. Or you don't have to educate them. Or you don't, they don't have to have a strong job. Last uh, spring. Margaret Engel, who 
graduated uh, this year, um, worked with us on a project called Move the Money Campaign. And what that did, and I brought flyers, and I know I didn't bring slides, um, but I brought flyers there in the back. It looked at, you know, how the money that's being, our taxes are in Hempstead, how they could be used instead. You know, people could receive unemployment, we could have coronavirus uh, uh, vaccines, we could have masks, we could have more elementary school teachers. It, there's a trade-off. And that's what peace and war does. If we invest in peace and we invest in war, or do we, uh, do we fund war or do we fund peace? And peace looks like those things. It looks like education. It looks like housing. It looks like good paying jobs. And it looks like preparing to deal with the climate change and the, and the pandemics um, that we're facing right now. Margaret did these wonderful graphics. Um, here's one of them. I should have had it on a big slide, but she did all of these things. It's just show and tell, make believe I'm in kindergarten. Um, and it was a trade-off. If we spent money here, we're not spending it there. And, and it's a 10% cut in military spending, but it's also just, to, even if you weren't going to cut it, how could our taxes be used instead? Um, and we looked at Uniondale, Hempstead, other communities, Nassau County, and, and Suffolk County as well. There's opportunities now. Um, Barbara Lee asked us to do that last week when in the House and in the, uh, they were considering the, the National Defense Authorization Act. We need to know this stuff. I, and it's a pain, I'm telling you, you know, looking at all this stuff and the amendments and all of that um, and who votes and how votes. But we pay very much uh, close attention to how our congressional delegation and our two New York senators are. But we need to hear the call, I think, of Barbara Lee and take this moment to reimagine national security um, and to pay attention to how the money is being used in 2021 and in 2022. Because the, the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, is about the 22 budget. Um, and the war in Afghanistan just ended, right? At the end of, uh, of August. And, and there's money that was appropriated in both those budgets, 21 and 22. Where's that money going to go? <laughs> and is it going to go for more weapons? Is it going to go to continue the wars in other places, even though the war has ended in Afghanistan? We meet, need to be involved in those kinds of decisions. Is it going to go to, as I said, to more weapons? Is it going to go to meet the needs of communities like Uniondale and Hempstead? Is it going to assist um, Afghan refugees? One of the most wonderful things about the Center for Civic Engagement has been student involvement and this collaboration we've had over so many years. The fellows, throughout our experience, and many of them, the CCE fellows, they bring skills to our work, things we didn't even know we, knew we needed, you know, like, um, because they bring creativity and, um, and energy um, and ideas. Um, they're looking at the world in a different way sometimes than, than we are. Um, and we can, we can learn from each other, so it's a collaboration. They've been creative and inspiring. And especially now in this time of pandemic, Margaret and I worked on a lot of this project of the Move the Money campaign with weekly meetings and monthly meetings. She and I had weekly meetings, but monthly meetings with our partners on other groups around the, uh, Long Island. Um, but especially at this time of pandemic when we're all developing new skills like Zoom meetings and webinars and social media, these CCE fellows have been invaluable. Um, and it's important to uh, honor our commitment to this next generation and we're doing that um, with our collaboration with Center for Civic Engagement. And I'm really happy that Alex is here because she's going to work with us this semester. Uh, as a fellow, and um, she also had some, she did it during the pandemic in 2020 on campus as well. So, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to wrap up by uh, thanking um, all of you for coming here today. It's a, a fitting acknowledgement of the work our students are doing, uh, the work of our faculty, but also of these uh, essential groups. Um, our actions are, are necessary to make our community and Long Island better and, and stronger. And this is also a proper way, I believe, uh, 
to welcome our, our new president uh, to recognize what we do and uh, what we value. So uh, thanks again to the representatives of the Uniondale Community Land Trust, the Long Island Alliance for Peaceful Alternatives, the Greater Uniondale Area Action Coalition, and the Health and Welfare Council of Long Island. Now, I want to remind everybody that we have a, a number of groups in the back tabling. And we designed this event so that the event would uh, end early uh, because these groups are groups that you can find volunteer opportunities with. We have a, uh, a couple of groups from off campus who are here that uh, seek volunteers, that they're good service learning opportunities, uh, internship opportunities. So please, this is where I'm going to go as soon as I, I finish, uh, I'm going to go to the back to uh, talk to each of these groups. So. Thank you all very much for coming today and have a great afternoon.